and I just keep track on time. Okay, it's 5.40. All right, so let's get started. Um, once we are recording, let's see. Let me know when we are. We are? Yep. Okay, awesome. Okay, so let's get started on bird anatomy and what makes these creatures tick. So if you're looking at this pigeon and you're wondering how it works on the inside, we're going to talk about how that works. What is the physical aspect, the anatomy, physiology, which is a little bit of the chemical aspect, the physical mechanics of how they work and their abilities. Um, and there are some parts of physiology that we are going to reserve for the next talk in April, which is gonna be on migration right when migration is happening. So you know that that is gonna be the next one. So, We've got really an astonishing variety of different birds on the planet. And if we're just speaking in terms of size, you've got the bee hummingbird, right? On the left, in the left picture. This thing weighs as much as a US dime, that's two grams. It's tiny, it looks like an insect. Europeans coming to the Americas saw this bird and they saw hummingbirds for the first time and they appeared to be as insects until I caught them and realized they were birds. So this bird is the smallest bird on earth and would easily fit within the eye sockets of the bird on the right, which is the ostrich that can weigh up to 300 pounds and stands over eight feet tall. And there's all kinds of birds in between this, right? There's an astonishing variety of birds because they have gone all over the world and adapted themselves not only to land, or to sky, but also to the ocean, and sometimes all of these at once. And what links them all, what primarily makes a bird a bird, perhaps the first thing we think of are feathers, right? Because nothing that isn't a bird has a feather. All birds have them. And all birds also have beaks. Now, the interesting uh, thing to note here with the beak is that the Greeks, um, before Linnaeus, used to classify birds and turtles and tortoises together because turtles and tortoises also have beaks. However, the difference here is that the beak of the tortoise and, and the turtle, apart, notwithstanding that, of course, they don't have feathers and they're not birds, but that beak is bony and it's not covered in the same kind of crannous sheath that birds have. Um, the other thing that all birds have in common is that they're bipedal, right? They have two legs and their front limbs are always used as wings, whether or not they can fly, right? They're warm-blooded, they're not cold-blooded, even though their ancestors were reptiles. Um, their ancestors were also likely to have warm blood. Um, they have four chambered hearts and they have furculae, which is to say that their clavicles are fused and all birds share these things. So let's start from the outset. We've got this thing called the feather, right? And we can see that the feathers have been adapted into so many different uses, but the most important ones are insulation and as airfoils. And insulation, I'm meaning that they take part in helping the bird maintain a constant and comfortable temperature, no matter what the outside temperature is, right? And this word, these two words that are written here, apterygia and pterygia, are referring to the skin tracts that you see on a bird where the feathers grow out. The feathers grow out of the skin rather like hairs that come out of follicles. Um, but a bird is not evenly covered with feathers. It's kind of strange, but if you hold a bird in your hand, if you ever take a bird in your hand and you blow on it, you'll see that there's feathers in certain tracts called pterygia. And then there's not feathers in other tracts. And that's where air can collect. Um, and air collects under the feathers as well. Um, so, bird, so birds use feathers to keep warm and also to stay cool if they need to. And they also primarily use them in order to get around. So as airfoils, which we'll go into later um, in the mechanics of flight. There are many other ways that feathers are used in birds from you know, being used as eyelashes where the feathers are so adapted that they look like hairs, you know, where the barbs are missing. And you would look at that, if you looked at just a photo of a bird's face, uh, such as the hornbill, and you looked at the feathers that line its eyelid, you would say they're hairs, but they're not, they're just modified feathers. 
Um, and they're used in many other ways as adornment, as we know from the tail of the peacock to the crest on this clover in the back. So feathers have been adapted into all these things and what makes the bird the bird. And so let's talk a little bit about feather structure. You can see here in this drawing I've made, um, the quill, the center of a feather, is called the rachis, right? And so it's this big shaft of keratin off of which they come off these barbs. And that's in the first box that I've drawn here. In the second box, more barbs still come off of the main barbs, and these are called barbules. And then finally, off of the barbules come barb cells. And barb cells are also called hooklets because they're really just tiny hooks. And so in this way, with this feather having all these barbs coming off and barbs coming off of those and barbs coming off of those with little hooks at the ends, they act like Velcro all together at, at a tiny level. They're all hooking onto each other. And so from looking at, at, the, at the feather from far away, you can see that it seems like all one solid surface. And yet because it's like Velcro, it's like a lot of hooks kind of hooking together that don't necessarily break, they simply unhook if you try to pull them apart, like Velcro, that makes a feather really resilient. It also makes it flexible, right? And there are two sections to the feather that I've shown here. Um, I've shown how, on the bottom how, if you take a usual flight feather, you'll see that there's like fluffy white stuff underneath. The difference there is that it's plumulaceous. It's, it's called that way because plumule comes from the Latin for small feather, and that area is hookless. All the hooks, they don't cling on to each other. There's not a really st a structure there. And they're just barbs with other barbs coming up of them without hooks, right? And that just is kind of like hair on hair on hair, really. Um, and that's really good at trapping heat and at trapping hot air. Um, and then I wanted to say that the two sides on either side of the rachis are called veins, V-A-N-E. And so when you're a bird and you have feathers, you're growing them out of your skin, out of a follicle, much as you would grow a hair. And much as hair grows, there is a blood source that goes to each feather while it's growing. It gets cut off after the feather is done growing. But while it's growing, the feather starts out encased in this waxy sheath and the barbs and the barbules and the barbicels develop on the inside. And eventually the sheath comes off as the feather starts growing. The bird kind of nibbles it off after everything inside has been done developing. And the feather will unfurl like a flag from inside the waxy sheath. And birds can do very well with feathers in particular because they are, you know, they're kind of a 2D surface and birds have beaks that can only really deal um, in a 2D way when they're rubbing them along the feathers. But because of feathers being like Velcro, birds can simply rub, rub their beaks along the feather and instantly repair whatever tears or whatever breaks have been going on. In the same way, you know, they're always cleaning their feathers. You'll see birds printing and they'll separate each feather and they'll reach down wherever any parasites have been living. Um, and sometimes they'll even remove the feathers that are getting frayed and old and they'll molt them um, in a very regular and precise way according to how their migration is placed and what they eat. So I'll talk a little bit about the mechanics of flight here. So when you're looking at this turn, this is a Caspian turn here, um, you'll see that both wings are in the shape of this curve, right? Especially the one facing towards us. It's got this curve and what it is happening here is you can see that the top is really, really smooth. You can't really see the bottom, but I'm gonna to explain to you what each feather is doing on the bottom. If you ever handle a flight feather, you'll notice that the top is super smooth and nice, kind of in the way that the whole entire bird's wing on the top is super smooth and curved. And on the underside, you'll see that it's concave, but that the rachis, the shaft of the feather, is, tends to be square, right? It tends to be square and it has ridges. And it seems that this would not be very good for allowing air to pass under the wing. And in fact, it is not. What the bird is doing is 
having this airfoil, it's allowing air to pass more quickly over the smoother curved upper side of its wing than it is under the wing. And when the air moves faster, the pressure decreases. And so the bird is lifted upwards by an increase in pressure underneath and a decrease in pressure above. And that is how the bird creates lift using each individual feather layered into a wing, which also acts like an airfoil. So each individual flight feather is an airfoil and so is the wing when they are all added together. Um, I wanted to mention thermal regulation a little bit and um, talking about how birds do this. In particular, I think I have a good example in the duck, which I didn't get a good picture of this, but I want to talk about heterothermy and how birds manage to keep warm in places that are really cold. So perhaps some of you have seen birds out standing on ice, things like ducks, you know, with webbed feet, which have veins in them. One would think that they'd have trouble standing on ice or swimming in water and they lose all their heat through their feet. But in fact, what birds do with heterothermy and in particular, these ducks and water birds is that they have these two veins going down each of their legs, right? And they have connections between these veins. What does this mean? This means that as the heat is lost in the legs and the blood is cold um, and it goes down to the leg and it loses heat, when it starts to travel back up, it meets with this canal that crosses across the vein where it just was and meets warm blood again and warms up before it reaches the body. And in this way, all the blood that is coming back up from the feet from, and through the legs into the body is being warmed up without actually sucking so much heat from the body as it would be to simply have a one-way route. And so this is how ducks and bulls and other waterfowl that like to stand on ice and sometimes flock on ice in this way, simply survive the cold by having their feet being cold, but their body staying warm through this type of heterothermy. There are different ways of keeping warm and cooling off that birds use with their feathers. Um, one that you have probably seen in your lives is the fluffing up um, that birds will do and they'll make their feathers stand up. And what this does is it greatly increases the volume of warm air that they can keep around their bodies. So when a feather is raised up at 90 degrees or a little less than 90 degrees, um, it can still overlap with its neighbors if the bird wants. Um, and in this way, it can really increase the volume of warm air that it's keeping next to its body. And in contrast, if they want to cool off, they don't want to do that. They want to decrease the amount of air that's warm that's next to their body. Um, and so because they can't, lose, um, they can't lose heat through panting and saliva, they do cooler fluttering instead, which is kind of like the bird uh, version of panting. And sometimes they even will urinate on their legs, which will then evaporate and take the bird's body heat with it. Let's talk a little bit about the size and heat efficiency color correlation. What I mean by this is that uh, the smaller you are, the more heat you're losing at once. Because the smaller you are um, in terms of, of volume and surface area, your surface area is greater in proportion to your volume than, for example, a really large bird. And so the larger you are, the less trouble you have losing heat because you've got more volume on the inside that is trapping heat and less skin through which to lose it. But when you're a really small bird, you could be in a lot of trouble just because you've got so much surface area in comparison to the, the rest of your body size um, to lose that heat. And that's why small birds tend to eat a lot more in proportion to their body weight um, and, and their size, as opposed to a large bird. Another thing that birds can do when they need to is they can actually shut off unneeded organs. And I put uh, quotation marks around the word unneeded because they do need it, but they can shut it off for a time. So um, things like penguins uh, can you know, go into a dive where they go really deep underwater and they don't want to lose a lot of heat 
into the water and they want to conserve energy and they can actually slow down the functions of the organs that are not exactly in their core. So they need their heart and they need to, their lungs and their inner circulatory system to be working, but their outer circulatory system is not working as hard. And similarly, you may have heard of hummingbirds in high places like the Andes when it gets cold at night and they would simply perhaps not survive because they can't fly around and they can't find nectar um, and they need to drink nectar every three hours when they're working, right? They actually slow their heart down. And this is called torpor. This is called torpor. And you'll, you'll go into caves perhaps in the Andes and find hummingbirds that look almost dead. You can touch them and they won't respond. But when it warms up again, they'll heart, their heart also speeds up. And in this way, birds can really regulate almost to an extreme amount how their organs work in order to survive according to the outside temperatures. And now we're going to the, the skeletal system. So we've gone, we've gone through the feathers and I wanna go now from the inside to the outside. We have a question which is, do birds have knees? That's an important question. I'm gonna answer that in a moment. Um, the bones of birds, you may have heard, have been fused for strength in the whole entire skeleton. And they're also hollow on the inside. And they have little struts inside the hollow, which makes it stronger than if it were just hollow like a straw, right? So their skeletons are actually really light. If you think about a bird like a frigate bird, which is a seabird with lots of big black feathers, but it's a very slight frame. Actually, if you took all of the feathers of that bird and weighed them in comparison to the skeleton, the feathers of this bird would weigh more than the skeleton does. That's how light the skeletons are, right? And they don't have, well, they don't have any teeth. So that, that's an important thing to note. So when, when you're looking at uh, comics where birds have teeth, that's not true. Sometimes they do have little, uh, what's it called? Little ridges along their beaks that help them to eat, but they're not for tearing in the way that eagles, for example, will use a hook, right? Um, and so you may be wondering to yourself, some people know that as in people, uh, you know, the human bone is not hollow, certainly not hollow. And instead of being hollow, it contains marrow, which are cells that produce blood, right? So if you think about the bird, then if its feathers are, if its bones are hollow, then how on earth does it produce blood, right? Um, and in fact, not all of its bones are hollow. And this is, I'm talking about birds and flying birds generally, because you know 95% of birds fly. And the other 5% that we know of that don't fly do tend to have less pneumatized bones or bones without so much air inside of them. And those also have more marrow filled bones. But when we're talking about birds that fly, the bones that make marrow tend to also be the ones that are surrounded by the most muscle, which makes sense because they want to provide new blood, new blood cells into veins that go to muscle immediately. Um, and also because that's, these are the bones that are most easily lifted up. So they tend to be the radius and the ulna and the wing bones and the core bones of the bird that produce marrow, right? And this drawing that I've made is a homology, which is a comparison between two very different um, species. So in one case, I'm, I'm showing the generalized human leg and how it looks in homology with the generalized bird leg. And you can see that birds are really standing on their toes. And we kind of knew that because we look at a bird and we look at their feet, we, we call it the toes. But actually what we would call the foot is homologous to only our toes. It's like standing on tiptoe. And so what we see as the backwards knee is actually like the, our heel, our talon, if you will. And the knee tends to be hidden way up there, closed up in the muscle of the bird. I wanted to show here um, this illustration 
of where the furcula is, where the wishbone is. So if you've ever gotten a chicken from the rotisserie, you might recognize the furcula where the two clavicles hold together in front. And this gives the bird structural strength when it's being, when it's in flight especially. And this furcula is being compressed. And then you can see that on the back, the thoracic vertebrae are fused, which like the furcula, when these two, when, when these bones are fused, this helps the bird to have internal strength because it is un undergoing a lot of stress when it's flying. Um, and so in the images on the right, perhaps you have seen this if you've ever gotten a chicken from the market and prepared it. Uh, in fact, I did not realize this for a long time, but you're actually looking at the fused ribs and vertebrae of the bird. And I also wanted to show the big, you know, the big kind of belly looking thing, right? That's the keel. And this will be important later because all that surface area that you see in that keel is for holding muscles, for muscle attachment. And that's because, uh, we'll, come that, we'll come to that later, but that's where the pectoralis muscle attaches and that's the muscle that allows the wings to work. So here to show further, We've got the bones that are involved in movement and in flight. So you've got here, um, let's see. Oh, sorry, I wanted to see if anybody is asking questions in the chat. I'll, I'll answer them at the end of the talk. Um, this, this, this is something that is included in this drawing. If you're looking at the radius and the ulna of the raised wing of the bones outlined in red, you can see that there's little bumps illustrated into this. And that's illustrating where feathers actually attach. So while feathers grow out of follicles in the skin, they actually produce a little bit of an attachment to the bone underneath because the wing is, you know, it's, it is skin and bone and muscle, but at, right there at the opposite of the leading edge, you've got, you can see the bumps where the bones have formed a little bit of an attachment to those feathers. So the flight feathers are really well attached to the bird. Okay, let's see, Karina. Um, I wanted to mention that when we're talking about the keel, you know, that, that big protruding belly that you see, that is really kind of a sharp thing that juts out and helps to fuse the ribs together at the bottom of the bird. Where that is attaching muscle in flying birds, that it juts out very little in birds that don't fly. So things like ostriches and kiwis, whose wings have reduced to almost nothing, um, and whose muscles have also been reduced to nothing, whose pectoralis muscle is practically non-existent, that piece of bone does, oh, is practically flat for them. They don't have a keel because they don't need all that surface air for their muscles to attach to in order to power flight because they don't fly. Um, hold on, for some reason, it's not allowing me to go to the next, um, to the next page. Well, since it's not allowing me to do that, um, for the moment, I want to go on and talk a little bit about the vertebrae, which are still visible over here on the left image. Um, and you can see that in this very typical bird skeleton, Birds really do have a lot of vertebrae. You know, we might think of owls as being necklace birds. Just as an example, think of owls as necklace birds. But in fact, most owls have 14 vertebrae, which is twice what we have. Uh, we have seven. And also visible in this left image, you can see the skull with its giant orbit, the eye orbit, where the eyes fit in. It's not showing this, but in the bird's eye, there is a bony structure called the sclerotic ring. Sclera means hard. And this actually helps to support the lens and to move the lens and allow the optic nerve to extend back through the orbit into the skull uh, and helps support the eye, which is really large for the proportion of the body size of the bird. Um, and then that little, that little fine um, bone that you can see below the orbit is actually pressed on by the lower jaw, the lower mandible, when the bird opens its mouth. 
and then it, that presses on the upper mandible and allows the bird to twist its mandible upward while it is opening the lower mandible downward. And that's why you might see something kind of weird that happens in birds where they'll open their beak and they look like perhaps they're yawning, but their upper mandible actually flexes upward a little bit. And that's because of the support of that little bone, the, I believe it's called the quadrangle bone, that helps to support the upper mandible. Okay, let's see. I am not able to move to the next slide, so. Let me, let me see if I can fix this for a moment. Mm. Mm. Well, I'm not sure why that is going on. Um, do you, do but, you want to unshare yes. to you, Nalina, and then play around with it? Maybe you can unshare and then share again. Oh. Um, that might help. I don't know. All right, let's, let's try that for a moment um, and see if that works. If you come out of um, present present presenter view, oh, um, and yes. then put it back to presenter view. Okay, let's try that. All right. Let's see if this works. You're all seeing this? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Let's see. Please do not be glitchy on me, PowerPoint. Okay. So we're back. So I wanted to show you here an example of how the knee and these different bones work in the Great Egret. So I, I found this photo that my sister took. Um, I wanted to show you how people look at this bird and they think he has a backward knee, when in fact, that is actually what would figure as the human ankle. Um, and then you can see the tarsus extending below that which for us, we call the metacarpals because then they extend down to our toes. But birds are really standing on their toes. Here I have some photos of what the bird bone looks on the inside. So in figures A, you can see these are bones belonging to birds that fly. They're hollow. They're still of an appreciable thickness and they've got all these struts inside. They're thin, but they're abundant. And this greatly reduces the weight of the bird's skeleton. Now in image B, you can see there's a lot of bone cells squished together and there's very, there are very few air pockets there. Uh, they're less pneumatized is the word. And that could be a bone, for example, from a penguin or a cormorant, which is a bird that is designed to sink because it has an advantage in sinking to seek fish. It is not a flying bird. And then on the right, there are some homologies between humans, lizards, and birds for the arm and how the bird's wing works. So as you can see in the bird, the fingers are fused. They're, they're not even recognizable. They've been fused down to nothing. Um, and even the carpometacarpus, which would be kind of like the bones that we have in our hands, in the palm of our hands, have been fused into this one bone with an, a pocket in it. And this fusing really allows for a reduction of weight and an increase of speed in birds. However, the thumb is pretty much still there. Sometimes you can see it in birds uh, when it grows a claw or when they use it as a spur. And when it's used as a spur, it's really a bone covered with some skin um, and a hard keratin sheath at the tip, which they can use to poke other birds when they're fighting them. Um, and when they grow a claw, they're growing a claw out of, out of that first digit, out of that thumb. And they sometimes use it to be able to climb up into the trees. And in particular, the birds that do this are young hoatsons, which are tropical birds. And the young babies will jump out of the nest if attacked by a predator, and then climb back up the tree to the nest looking really a lot like our depictions of dinosaurs. It's really amazing to see. All right, so to speak on the muscular system, we saw the keel before, and I want to go back to this, uh, to this, this image to show you what's going on here. So the keel, that big bony structure underneath the bird, is where all the muscle will attach. But you might wonder to yourself, why would you have a big muscle underneath yourself? 
if you're trying to pull your wings up, isn't that the biggest, um, is that where you want to use the most force, right? And, and what actually happens is that the pectoralis muscle is indeed attached under the bird, but as it goes up towards the attachment points of the clavicle into the shoulder, the tendon of the muscle tapers off and then goes through the glenoid and attaches to the back. So, and, and then to the, to the shoulder and the wing. So what actually happens is that when the muscle is pulling, when this pectoralis muscle is pulling underneath the bird, is actually pulling on the tendons on the outsides that attach to the wing around this fulcrum of the shoulder, around this glenoid. And those wings then are pulled upwards from those attachment points, which is really amazing to me that they have actually developed this amazing muscle mass that is beneath them. So they don't have to develop a lot of muscle on their back. They can actually develop a lot of muscle on their breasts, which not only helps to pull their wings, but then is also a great way to thermoregulate and keep all your heat in front of you and inside you. So that's the pectoralis muscle. And there are some changes in the muscular system as a bird grows um, because when, when, you're, when you're a young bird, and you're trying to get out of your egg, the egg is not so easy to break. And so birds develop not only a, an egg tooth, which is the nail that appears, is like a little hard calcareous nail at the ends of bird beaks, which they will use to pierce through the eggshell when they're strong enough and developed enough to be hatched. But also young birds, very young birds that are not hatched yet have this muscle that's the most developed muscle at that time in their neck, which allows them to peck really strongly at the eggshell in order to be able to get out. And what they'll do is they peck in a circle and then push themselves out using this muscle, which later in life and very soon later disappears. It atrophies down to nothing. The nutrients go to somewhere else and it probably never uses that muscle again in its life. It only uses it once to get out of the nest. And birds will actually, uh, especially birds that dwell on cliffs and things like wood, well, not wood ducks because those young ones leave the nest pretty early, but alcids, things like puffins and kitty wakes will, you know, nest on cliffs and grow up on the cliff and not knowing how to fly, they'll flap their wings until they're strong enough to, and then just take off for the first time when they're ready. Let's talk a little bit about the digestive system. So the digestive system of birds is really very effective. Um, it's very efficient. And I'll go into a little bit what all the different parts of it. And the main parts to start with are, you know, you've got the esophagus, which is where the butterfly on the left picture is going to go to immediately when fed to the bird on the left. Um, and then it hits the crop and the crop is kind of an anti-stomach pouch. It's, it's before the stomach. Um, and that's where food stays and starts to be ground down with stones before it later goes down to the stomach, which has the gizzard. And that has the really strong muscular tissue that grinds down the food. And afterwards it goes down to the intestines. The interesting thing about birds is that they don't actually have a bladder. They're so efficient that they've actually completely eliminated the organ from their bodies. And why is this? This is because um, whereas in mammals, where we take our food and our water, and then we produce a lot of this, this molecule called urea, birds actually perform a, a chemical treatment that turns two molecules of urea into uric acid, one molecule of uric acid. Uric acid is less toxic than urea is actually. And it takes a lot less water to flush out of your system. And so in this way, birds have eliminated the need for a bladder. They do this simple chemical trick where they have a lot less or, or half uh, as many molecules really to get rid of with a lot less water. And they simply combine that with their feces in order to get all of, all, rid of all of that at once. Um, and back to the thermoregulation thing, 
depending on size. It's true that the smaller you are, the more heat you lose. And therefore, the more you eat in terms of body percentage. So when people say, oh, you know, that person eats like a bird, which in human speak means that they don't eat very much. That's actually inaccurate because a lot of small birds eat something like 20 or 30% of their body weight per day, which is like, if you weigh, you know, if you weigh 200 pounds, that's 40 pounds a day, that's, that's ridiculous. And I want to show a little bit the variety of, of food that birds have managed to eat. So on the left, you see the Lammergeier, which is a European vulture. Um, and it is able to digest bone and marrow. And in fact, its stomach is so corrosive. It's so corrosive that they, it's been said that it can finish a cow um, in eight hours, which is really amazing. That's, that's, that's got a lot of uh, acid in it. Um, and the center bird, you can see the black-throated green warbler, which eats insects. Um, and then on the right, you can see a hummingbird, probably a tropical hummingbird female, sticking its tongue out. And those birds feed on nectar. And there's all kinds of other things in between that birds eat, because birds also eat meat. And all, all of these birds don't necessarily only depend on eating what they eat. So the Lammergeier, while it usually eats bone and marrow, may sometimes eat meat. And the black-footed green warbler, while it picks off insects, will sometimes eat fruit. And hummingbirds, similarly, will pick up insects and get a little bit of protein along with their nectar when they're visiting a the flower. Now to talk about the respiratory system, birds are really interesting in the terms that they don't have single-step lungs. They have multi-step lungs. And what I'm talking about here is when we breathe, right, as mammals with non-multi-step lungs, we take one breath and we exhale the same breath. This does not happen in birds because birds have a lot of different little sacs going along with these bronchi, right? These long tubes that are all absorbing oxygen as opposed to our alveoli, which birds don't have. Um, and the air moves in, as you can see in, in image A, it moves in on the first breath. On the second breath, it's not completely moved out. It's still being absorbed. The oxygen is still being absorbed in these bronchi, in these parabronchi. Then in inhalation two, where this blue air, this new blue air comes in, the yellow air, the air that's already gone through now three movements is still not out yet. And in exhalation two, this blue air is only now starting to come out um, and the yellow air is finally probably all coming out. And so what this means for the bird is that when it's inhaling and exhaling, it's still absorbing oxygen, new oxygen, on the exhale, which makes them really efficient in terms of oxygen intake. And it makes them, this is what probably makes them able to fly, is this ability to take in oxygen really efficiently through this multi-step lung system. And now talking about air sacs, they have a lot of air sacs all over their body that are able to absorb oxygen. Um, they have lungs proper and then they have these air sacs everywhere. And so what happens when, you know, Sometimes people have a bird that is choking, you know, whose main system for breathing in the throat is blocked, whose windpipe is blocked. Sometimes you can actually break a bird's leg and it can breathe through the air sac that is connected through the leg. Um, and you can help a bird survive that way and set its leg later. And some people have done that. And to go briefly over the reproductive system. So the gonads in birds, which are the reproductive organs, are actually really small when it's not the reproductive season. When the reproductive season is going on, they swell to their size that, you know, when they work. Um, and in raptors, actually, the females are larger than the males because theirs are always, um, theirs are always in use and the males are not necessarily always in use. Um, and so you may be wondering to yourself, for bird reproduction and copulation, if they've got this kind of all-purpose hole or the cloaca, right, which is Latin for sower, where everything comes out, um, then how on earth do they copulate? Well, what they do is called the cloacal kiss. So it's just the male cloaca pressed to the female cloaca 
and he passes along his sperm to her, to her um, and that fertilizes her eggs. And then what happens in the female is that this egg then comes loose from the ovary and goes down along the reproductive tract and is fed nutrients and eventually given this hard calcareous shell and at the very end given pigment and then laid. And to speak a little bit on the nervous system, it is also probably inaccurate to say that uh, a bird brain is not intelligent because birds, many birds have been shown clearly to be intelligent, especially those ones called corvids and parrots, because those are actually now proven to be able to think abstractly um, and make plans, um, you know, and change, how do you say, change the order of their plans according to what they see in their head and what they're being, um, what they're being, you know, told with information. And another thing to note is that bird brains can be quite convoluted. And what I'm talking about with convolution is the folding or the wrinkling of the brain. And the more folded and wrinkled that a brain is, the shorter the distance is between two neurons to make a connection. What does this mean? This means that a brain that is smooth has only, you know, it has a few straight paths or, or has rather has one straight path, right? Between two different neurons to make a connection. Um, but the more wrinkled that the brain gets, the shorter it is between these two neurons um, to make that connection. So kind of the faster these connections can be made and the more connections can be made between all these neurons. The other thing to note about the bird's nervous system is that they have an enlarged optic nerve um, and that's because of their ancestry with dinosaurs that dinosaurs also, like birds, were really dependent on sight. Um, and mammals were, for a very long time, especially during the reign of the dinosaurs, where mammals were not uh, super successful except underground, um, were really dependent on scent. And so birds have this kind of leftover thing of being really good with their eyes. Okay, let's try to go on. Oh, it's doing the glitchy thing again, hold on. I mean, let me try and get back on here. Let's see. Okay, we've moved on past the, okay, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about the beak. The other thing that makes a bird a bird, right? So when we're talking about the beak, we see a huge amount of uses for the beak in different birds. Birds use the beak as scissors, as chisels, as sieves, nets, spears, hooks, a lot of things, you know, even as Swiss army knives in the case of the corvids, who can use them to crush things, to peel things, scrape things off the ground, to hook at things, right, and, and uh, reach into small areas um, with small volume to catch things, right? Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, give me a moment, let's see, don't freeze on me. Give me a moment, guys. Um, well, I'm, while well, I'm waiting for this to, to go on and work, I don't know why it's freezing. Um, I will also note that the beak is toothless, right? It doesn't have any teeth. It's made of bone covered with this keratin that grows with a, a system of uh, a nerve net and uh, also blood vessels underneath that are growing on the bone and then grow a keratinous sheath on the outside of the beak, which is called the ramphofica. And that's how come, oh, come on, there we go. That's how come birds' beaks, while they look very much like they're made of bone, are actually keratinized and quite sensitive to touch and also to heat. So let's go a little bit into bird senses here. So their tactile senses are actually quite good. Um, I was, as I was mentioning before, bill sensitivity is pretty important because that's how they really manage their world. Their beak is like, is, it's like having a hand on the front of your face, really. And so in some birds, they can even move their beak flexibly, as, as you see in this image on the right uh, with this bar-tailed godwit, which, by the way, I've never seen myself. I've, seen, I've often seen godwits feeding. But here in this image, you can see the very tip of the beak is mobile. 
So this bird can actually control the very tip of that beak that seems to be so hard and stiff. It can actually control that. And that control of that very distant tip to actually manipulate food. So you can see later on, it's actually caught a worm in the sand. And the bill sensitivity in shorebirds is actually such that they can stick it into the ground, into the sand in particular. And they can actually detect interstitial pressure, which is the, the pressure in between individual grains of sand. And so that's kind of like sticking your hand into sand and being able to tell where a worm is or where a sand crab is, you know, a few inches away or a few centimeters away with your hand. And birds can do this and, and shorebirds can do this with their beaks. Bird's sense of hearing is also very good. Um, I wanted to show in this case, we are all very acquainted with the owl and with the family of owls that are very good at hearing because they rely on their hearing just as much or if not more than on their vision in order to be able to hunt at night or in the dark or in the twilight as they often do. And in fact, in this barn owl, the ears are placed asymmetrically rather than at the same level. So they are actually on different planes um, in space to be able to then triangulate with the sound that's coming from somewhere else and pinpoint exactly where, for example, that mouse is in the dark without using their eyes. And they've tested this on owls that are in, you know, they're in rooms that have practically no light at all. And they put a mouse in there and the owl catches it just using its sense of hearing. And of course, birds in general are very good at hearing because they also rely on song a lot to communicate. And many birds are really good at hearing above the pitches that we, that we can hear. But generally, we are very fortunate in that bird calls and songs are usually in the range of human hearing. They're, they kind of overlap with uh, the, the, from the low to the high, we, we kind of miss out on the very, very highest pitches that birds make. But otherwise, we're very fortunate to be able to hear most of the sounds that birds make. And then speaking on sense of smell, birds don't tend to have a really good sense of smell but some vultures do, not all of them. But if we're talking about turkey vultures, the, the one in the photo is a black vulture, but the turkey vulture has these processes in its nasal cavities that look like little spirals. And what's that doing is, is that instead of having kind of like two straws, right? Uh, where you can take in air and then detect scents that are going on in there, instead of having two straws with that limited amount of surface area, it's actually got this tissue that coils around and around and around, kind of like a snail shell. And that's why they're called conche, like a snail conch. Um, and so turkey vultures actually have these conche where the air goes through and is tasted or smelled, but rather tasted because it presses against the, the flesh over and over and over again, so that they're actually really good at detecting merkeptin and also other chemicals. But mercaptan is something that is given off by a decaying body, which we also use to flavor natural gas. And that's actually how sometimes people know there is gas leak because there's a lot of vultures gather around a spot on the ground, um, kind of looking at apparently nothing, but actually there's a gas pipe um, leaking gas there that the vultures are sensing. Otherwise, most birds are not really good at, you know, at, at smelling things. The only other ones that are, that are pretty importantly good at that are seabirds like fulmars um, and petrels. And we know that because they're really attracted to the scent of plankton. They're really good at smelling plankton from even miles away. So petrels and fulmars and albatrosses but, and, and vultures, but most of their birds are not really good at smelling things. Their tactile abilities are very good. Um, and I'm gonna show a couple of examples of how they are. Uh, here you can see on the left, this chalk-browed mockingbird in Argentina has got these rictal bristles, which are like 
They're like whiskers. They look a lot like whiskers, but those are in fact modified feathers. And those stick out of the sides of its mouth. And many birds, especially many small birds that eat bugs have these because it helps them not only to sense what bugs are flying around them and especially if they're about to catch one, um, but also to guide the creature into its mouth. And so things like night jars, um, which have these really wide mouths and a lot of rictal bristles, actually use them so that the, if the bug tries to escape to one side, it's actually caught in these really fine feathers and guided into the mouth of the bird. But birds can definitely feel with these whisker-like feathers. And then on the right, there's a special trick that these birds, these Australian megapodes, um, this megapodes are a family of these kind of like brush turkey birds that live in Australia and New, New Zealand. And they're really good at sensing heat with their tongues. And so they build these mounds where they have their eggs and they fill them with decaying vegetation. And instead of keeping their eggs warm by themselves, they actually use the heat from the decaying vegetation because of the activity of bacteria in the leaves to kind of, they, they use that mound to trap that heat and then direct them towards the eggs. And these birds make sure that the nest is warm enough, that the mound is warm enough for their eggs by sticking their tongue into the pile and deciding whether or not it needs more or less decaying vegetation. And, you know, Birds use their tongues as tools. So in, in, the, in the parrots, I, I realize by the way that we're running short on time. Um, I'm going to go through this and I think, I think this might be the last slide. Um, I want to show that on the right, these macaws actually don't have wet tongues, they have dry tongues, which are really like, you know, another addition as a tool to their beaks. And they can really use this tongue very cleverly to manipulate things. And there's really a very great variety of tongues in the world, bird world because sometimes they use it to suck up juice or to lap it up. Um, in the case of the woodpecker, um, this, I think this is the last slide, they actually have a very long tongue that is actually stored in this thing called the hyoid horn all the way around their skull. So that's how they can have a really, really long tongue. And it's actually stiff at the end so that when they're burrowing into trees, they can poke at that tongue and get a grub, kind of like you would spear something with a toothpick. Um, and there's really a, a very large variety of ways that birds' tongues are used. But I think that is, let's see, I think we're out of time and that's the end of my lecture. But, um, and then the, the very last thing is that birds, you know, they have very, very good eyesight. Um, and their trick with eyesight is that they can see in ultraviolet. That's the special thing that they can do. Uh, and otherwise they're very, very visual oriented and they have all these other things that I have mentioned before. And now I think I'll, now I think I'll go on to questions. All right. Thank you all for staying around. Uh, I'm gonna go look in the chat. Uh, <laughs> oh, Nick was saying your bird experience is that one lives in your house and screams at you every morning. Ah, yes, having a, a a uh, budger gar is like that. For Catherine, I'm assuming there are anatomical trade-offs to having stronger fused vertebrae. Yes, there are, because if your vertebrae are fused, they are actually, of course, less flexible. So, you know, birds can't perform a lot of tricks with those vertebrae. They can't really arch their backs backwards because all of those bones are fused together. Uh, so yes, there are trade-offs to that. Uh, Catherine says, I once responded to a gas leak in an engineering lab that ended up being an extremely small, oh, <laughs> methyl mercaptan still. Yes, so methyl mercaptan, I guess was, you know, it, it is the thing that we use to flavor natural gas, but if you spill it by itself, you're also gonna smell it and think that's gas. When it's really, the only thing we smell is the mercaptan. From David. What is the ratio of lift to weight of a single feather? And would that ratio get bigger in terms of the lift increasing exponentially when multiple feathers comprise a flight surface such as the weight? So that's a very good question. That depends on the feather. Um, and that, that really depends what kind of feather it is. And I would say that, of course, if you go from something like a contour feather that keeps the bird warm, uh, versus, you know, go, going from, or going from even the secondary flight feather, 
all the way up to the first flight feather is the leading edge of the wing. Um, the lift at the leading edge of the wing is much greater than what is given at the secondary feathers. Now, for the second part of the question, would that ratio get bigger in terms of the lift increasing? Would the lift increase exponentially when multiple feathers comprise a, a flight surface such as a wing? I don't think they would increase exponentially, um, just because I'm not a you know I'm not a physics person, and we'll probably get more into this physics in my next talk on on migration. Um, but when you're looking at these two uh, these feathers being added up all along in one wing, I would think that their lift is added. And that rather than thinking so much of the wing as a lot of like of, of, of a lot of you know feathers all added together, it's much better to think of the wing as a single airfoil. Um, the only amendment I would make to that is that when a bird lifts its alula, which is the thumb, which also often has feathers on it, it acts as a separate airfoil. Um, and then when you're doing physics on birds, you'd have to count two airfoils in one wing. And then this question from Nicholas Pinto, why is Mr. Murph so dusty? So your bird is dusty, uh, Nick, because he is probably molting feathers or growing new ones in, and the ker keratin sheets on the feathers are wearing off. And it really is a lot like dandruff because it's the same stuff, it's keratin. Um, though birds and reptiles have the keratin protein that's much harder than ours, it's keratin B rather than keratin A, but that's probably why your bird is so dusty. Uh, I would think that it's not dusty because he doesn't move around a lot, because I know he does. <laughs> All right, are there any more questions? Oh, from Ava. Don't parrots produce a powder that acts as oil as in other types of birds? Yes, that's a very good point, actually. I hadn't thought of that for, for, the, for this cockatiel. That is correct, actually. Um, certain feathers actually wear off into a powder that allows all the feathers to rub together very smoothly, uh, almost like an oil, and allow water to come off without really clinging to the bird. Yes, that is true. That may be why your bird is so dusty as well. And yeah, Nick says, if, if it were exponential, you use the structure in the aircraft. Yes, uh, turbulence does become unmanageable at high, high speed for certain birds. Um, and that's why when birds reach really high speeds, they just, they don't uh, keep them out anymore and rather uh, fold them in. From Renee. How do birds stay warm and dry in the rain? That's a very good question. So it does have a lot to do with insulation um, and also with their behavior in the rain. And what I've seen, especially recently, uh, as it's been rainy here in Thousand Oaks in California, is birds will sit quietly in trees and they'll, they'll get into shelter out of the rain. But what they'll also do is they'll tuck their wings kind of over their back and close to their body. Um, and I think that they really try during rainy periods to keep their feathers well oiled um, using, you know, using this gland that they have to oil all the feathers and they really take care of the feathers when it's rainy. Because I think I, I, from my experience when I'm seeing birds that are really tattered during a rainstorm or during bad weather, it's really bad news if your feathers get out of shape or are really worn down. That's, that's really like trying to uh, survive a rainstorm or, or several days of rainstorm in a coat that's all broken. So birds are particularly taking care of their feathers during that time and they're trying their best to stay out of the rain and out of the wind when they're doing that. And um, I would also add that they're, they're usually not foraging out of that because not only does that increase their exposure, but it also wastes their energy when they're less likely to find food. So birds are far more likely to go into torpor or use far less energy by slowing down, slowing down their heart rate and slowing down their breathing when the weather is bad. Um, let's see, from 
Oh, well, from David, I would think that if it is exponential, it must be a property of the natural feather that would be difficult to reproduce in synthetic fly systems. Yes, that would be true. And natural feathers are, are in themselves difficult to reproduce in, in, you know, in synthesis. Nobody has ever made a fake feather before. It's simply not possible to make. Have you ever heard anything about birds crying to help maintain plumage? I have actually not. Um, I know that birds do produce tears, and I know that moths will go to sleeping birds who sometimes sleep with their eyes half open and they'll drink these tears, but I did not, I've never heard anything about birds crying to help me too. Would you, would you like to explain more? I've, I've never heard of that. We have pet ducks. Yes. When they preen sometimes, it's only about like one, only in one of their preening sessions a day especially after they've been really wet. They'll mm -hmm. cry when they preen. Huh. Rub it all over their bodies like they're rubbing oil. Rub their heads around. It's like a, the tears are sticky and thick. Wow. So I've never heard of that. Anything about it. I just was wondering if anybody else had. Yeah. I have, I have, I've never heard that, but that's really interesting. Um, I'm going to have to do research on that. I have to I have to look that up um, and see whether that's a thing. It might just be a thing for ducks, but I've I've certainly never heard of it or or read about it. That's that's really interesting. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, unless there are any more questions, I think that as it is already six forty one, I will let you all go. But I want to thank you all for coming. Um, and I'll let you know that my next talk is on migration, which is going to be happening in April, uh, right in the thick of migration. So in the next talk, we're going to be talking a little bit about how birds' bodies are specialized to move long distances and where they go and what they do and how, in fact, swallows don't actually turn into frogs and dive into pools for the winter. They actually migrate. So we'll talk about that next time. Thank you so much to all of you for coming. You'll be getting an email about the next uh, talk pretty soon. And thank you, Lois. Thank you to Delina. That was great. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Great lecture. Thank you. So knowledgeable. Yay. Bye. Thanks, Teo. I'm making chicken soup despite the birds. <laughs> oh, you. I thought it was How good dare time. you? Miserable, though. I'm, Mr. Bird is watching me do it, too. He has How, no qualms with it. How inappropriate, gosh. <laughs> wow. Wow, Nick. Well, I, I, you know, it was helpful that I could actually see the, you know, the anatomy being described. It was, it was thighs. So. <laughs> All right. I'm closing this.